say my essay. It's not a blank canvas. I, uh, I had experiences here in Hamilton, the community of Hamilton, which I didn't quite understand or had some notions about. So I was looking forward to the frameworks I learned here to help interpret them. And I was also looking forward to what I've learned here, some of the projects I've done here, and carrying them forward in my artistic practice after this point. So this is what this very much is about, and we'll examine that in a second. First things first. Thank you to Professor Lesplat, my supervisor, and thank you to Dr. Christine Quayle for your continued patience, <laughs> the second reader. Uh, as we'll go through this project, you'll see that I've designed this in a way to very much challenge uh, some notions of academia, and the second reader in particular. So don't be too scared, no. <laughs> we'll go through that. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Dr. Sarah Bannerman uh, for um, letting me audit her class. And for her first class, I learned a lot of very valuable uh, theories and frameworks that come into play here. Thank you, Dr. Sevenier, for the philosophies from your class, the philosophers, uh, in particular, Michel de Montaigne. He's the uh, obscure 16th century French philosopher who invented the essay. But in particular, he uh, believed that our true discourse of our lives um, is our only true discourse. I badly paraphrase that. Uh, Dr. Sarah Bannerman's class taught me um, critical approach and the concept of reflexivity. Our relationship to our community, for example, um, and examining that, and that comes into play in this project as well. What I've done is eight augmented reality installations throughout the city of Hamilton. It's pretty cool. <laughs> but <laughs> it seems like just something cool, like, hey, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna write and do it. It didn't quite happen that way. So to understand what this actually is and how I arrived here is to understand a process. So we're gonna go through a bit of that process, what it, what it wasn't before it became what it was, um, so to speak. And some of the theories and some of the philosophies that kind of like got brought into the process on the way. Okay, so my original idea was, what would Hamilton look like if activists always won? Uh, I was involved in activism here. So, um, a lot of the people, I was involved with a lot of people in uh, Ryan's presentation. Apparently I inspired some of them as well through my failed attempts to save some heritage. Um, now I, I'm not so keen on activism in the city and I've got some criticisms about community and the very concept of community as well. And that comes into play through, through the artwork. So I had this idea, okay, so we'll make, a, we'll make a, a version of Hamilton that looks different, that looks like it had like a stadium at West Harbor or it still had King's Forest or you know, these, uh, they didn't, buildings weren't torn down to put in that beautiful Jackson Square Mall. Uh, I kind of, you know, I, I didn't really end up like, this was in my initial idea and I didn't really, I kind of had doubts about it because I didn't want to end up being some sort of illustrator and a lot of what I think I was actually talking about was just old photographs. Um, I didn't want to like kind of end up building someone else's um, version of Hamilton. I wanted to do something more critical, something from inside me. So anyways, I was trying to figure out, okay, what am I gonna do? Second life, I wanted to build this immersive environment. I wanted to uh, maybe do machinima, and where, where would you see this? Would you go into a gallery? Would it be in my house? Would it be at, you know, the Mac gallery? Like there was all kinds of these kind of cumbersome physical kind of considerations that kind of come over and you know, if you're struggling with the concept, artistically at least, uh, there's means problems with it. So, you know, it, it, it really, you know, I realized, and this will come into play with some of the philosophies later, that, you know, I, I didn't, wasn't really interested in building a huge technical platform in order to then jump off there and build a narrative, and I was just interested in the narrative in the first place. So maybe I should not worry about these, these things. So I, I didn't know what to do, but then I went to this. I'll tell you a story. <laughs> so, I think future cities, I'm thinking like fantastic future Jetsons, you know, like <laughs> platforms and spaceships and stuff. And no one else there did, right? <laughs> I mean, they're talking about mixed use of like industrial, residential, blah, blah, blah. It's very boring. Um, but there was this kid, it was like, there's a kid, like 10 or 11, and he's, he's precocious. He's sitting in the front row, like right in front of this, this mayor. 
and, and he wants to like put ideas out and you know they kept not letting him speak but then this kid like eventually <laughs> it's so funny um they let him put his idea forward um and he said this is what i want the future of the city to look like i want to fill the red hill valley parkway with water and make it a river and then i want to line it with dog parks and mansions <laughs> yes <laughs> that was it <laughs> that was the psychological manifestation of the criticism of a landscape that i was looking for i didn't want to like rebuild some building that was torn down like here it is i wanted to like create fantastic i don't want to be not that i want to create fantastic i'm feeling anxious not that i want to create fantastic um uh, scenarios but I didn't want to be limited by a sense of this is this I can prove that this could have been here that's not what I want I want to like more of a intuitive criticism of this community so I decided to do that now to push away the engineering and science artist concerns of building a platform to do this I decided to go with a commercial app a commercial augmented reality app called Erasmus. And it's something you can look at through your phone. Um, so, I mean, there's all kinds of cool mixed reality, virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, you know, masters and doctors, like, projects I researched. Um, but that's what I mean. I, I'm happy with a piece of charcoal and a paper in order to get something across. So, with that same sensibility, like, I mean, I'm not going to weave my own canvas or mix my own paint. <laughs> I can call that a painting. I'll just buy it. So I just took this app, decided just to use this, this medium, and kind of push it, what it could offer me, in order to tell these narratives um, to go forward. So this is um, very, uh, you know, it's very widely popular. It's not popular in Hamilton. It's not popular in Canada so much as it is in the rest of the world. I thought that was interesting. So I'm kind of like, yes, I'm one of the first augmented reality public artists, like, you know, in this, uh, in this city. Uh, so that was kind of cool. But as you can see, it promises two, two uses. One is you can, it's for magazines or images. You look at them, it, the image triggers uh, animation on your mobile device. Or you can basically look at a piece of scenery, it's geocoded, and that'll activate uh, an augmented reality event as well. So that was, you know, so that, those are the two areas I use this to go forward. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> And I installed eight augmented realities throughout the throughout the city. Um, so instead of the, so you can see sort of at this point how it became from the idea of an immersive environment to portray changes in the environment to the immersive real environment to portray changes in the environment. Um, so I have you know as, as close as to the Westdale Theater, which is just down the road here, all the way to Red Hill Valley Parkway. I didn't do that kid's story. I thought about it, but you know, I'll let him grow up and do that. He's it's going to be something someday. Um, over here in the pier, looking towards Randall's Reef, um, and throughout the lower city, which is where I live, uh, in beautiful Barton Village, which will come into a, an important point in a second. So I call these contested sites. What was interesting to me about these sites is that there's levels of, um, you know, this site should be for this, or this site is for that. But there's some, having been on the ground, having been here, um, you know, I know like this is not necessarily true, or this didn't arrive at this point in a peaceful, democratic manner. For instance, tearing down heritage buildings, it's a very dubious process. Um, there's, some, there's some shady stuff going on there. But at the end, they put in the patch of grass and say this is the community's really happy about this, for example. So that's a contested site. This is a contested site. This is on the lookout, and this is the site I'll bring you through. There's, like I said, there's eight installations, but I'll bring you through mostly one. And we have time at the end of another. Um, this is another contested site because you're looking across out here. And is this a community or is this industry? Now, some of the rhetoric you'll get in the very large public or political sphere will tell you that, yeah, that, that steel refinery, that's community, right? It's inseparable from the way of life here. This, is, this has never been any other way. Um, so the you know, lookout is kind of framed in, in a normalizing uh, sort of fashion. 
So, well, anyway, what is community? So, like I said, I had some criticisms about this. Um, I'm not so optimistic, maybe some of my colleagues are about this. But for this, I took um, inspiration from Sue and Lee. Um, through the two basic and contradictory stances of community as a binary relationship can be understood as consisting of a theological view of community one derived from natural state of unity between individuals versus a more resistant reading of the unified state as actually representing the ultimate logic of totalitarianism. I'm like, yes. <laughs> of course. Because like a lot of like you know the, the politics in my area is like they pick out people who already agree with them, consult with them, and then tell you that this is what the community wanted. And then they tear down that damn heritage building, someone makes a couple hundred thousand dollars, right? And you end up with a patch of grass. So this, you know, embodied this. Now, this is the paradox of community contemporary fiction. I'm making artworks. They're little fictions on themselves. So I think there's a relationship between art making and, and creative writing in this, in this sense. Now I also, um, really at this point, it resonated with me. Um, you know, bashing the public sphere. You know, the Habermask is really savaged in some of these readings I, I wrote about uh, how well the public sphere works for meaningful discourse. What we have is sort of a, a shell of a meaningful discourse from my experiences over the last four years. So I approached this with a framework of creationist research. Um, by these two professors from Concordia University of Montreal. And what they mean by this is that doing artwork, experiences, performance art, etc., can actually generate interesting uh, data research, research data maybe, um, and you can, you, know, you can use that. So by going to these different eight sites, um, through process of experimentation and testing at them, I they changed them, I brought in more theories, and the artworks changed. So this is very much the, the framework I used to approach that. The other big influence that came in about halfway through was on a Haraway. Because it's, we've gone out from a virtual immersive environment in my head, now we've gone to a very physical location. This is where I am. This is what I'm looking at. This is where I've been. Um, so her situated knowledge is, science question, feminism improves a partial perspective, quote, this is awesome. <laughs> so yeah, I live in Ward 3, which shouldn't make a big difference in a democratic society, but it does. These are an arbitrary boundary drawn that dictates how people in Ward 3 are treated as opposed to Ward 2 or Ward 1. Ward 3 had to fight for a bicycle lane. This Ward, Ward 1, doesn't. There's already bicycle lanes, as an example. So these are power moves. Also, I, I enjoyed this quote. Um, the partial perspective versus the God trick. Promising a vision from everywhere and nowhere equaling fully. At that point I realized, yeah, that was my ego talking. My ego to create a whole world of Hamilton and then impose my will upon it, right? <laughs> I'm being an arrogant bastard. <laughs> so I'm gonna like take that sense and I'm gonna reverse it. I'm just gonna tell you what I've experienced in my own intimate artworks from within these locations. And you know what? If you want to partake in that, you have to go to those locations too. So now we're starting to get a sense of my academic criticism to the second reader. It's like, okay, if you really want to experience this artwork, you're going to have to put down that essay and you're going to have to go out and into the communities where these installations are and experience them there. Which is something I've heard a lot about in this program was people write these brilliant essays and then only a few people read them or there's some sort of disconnect from the community and then there's there's stuff going on that's rectifying that, and there's, uh, but in general, it's been a problem, apparently. So I'm touching upon the concept of urban flaneur, which I see as sympathetic to Haraway's position of situated knowledge as well. Because the urban flaneur, according to Frederick Ross, philosophy walking, sort of like goes across those power boundaries, those boundaries defined, that define power, and sort of, uh, subvert the environment, which our environment has been constructed to be a process of monetization. Like if you walk through uh, Jackson Square, you're supposed to buy something. Um, people interpret a lot of the, the roadways through my ward as, as ways to get through the area as quickly as possible. So the two insights I had during the testing experimentation of consensus sites was no one cares if it's digital. Now what I mean by that, which is a hell of a thing to say in this program, is that if I'm just making these little clunky visuals on a little teeny five inch phone and you're just going, you're standing there looking at the phone, 
it's nothing special. We're all doing that these days. You can access that same part of the internet at home. So installing text narratives instead in some of these spaces um, really address, you know, to me, for a versus the virtual and the real worlds. Text narratives utilize the imaginations of the, of the participants. So I found this very interesting, and that's something what I was talking about before I'm going to carry with me in my practice after this. But enough text. Let's look at some pictures. So what we'll look at is the volcano. Now, the reason I wanted to create this book, this picture book, was to address the, the problem of something just being digital, because it will disappear someday. But at least this book of the trigger images will still exist. So artistically, that was a addressment of that concern. As you can see, here's a picture of that volcano lookout. Here you are looking at over here. There's a picture of it. Here's this again. Okay, so now here we are with the book. Now you see some of the rhetoric this is talking about from the Economic uh, Council of Hamilton talking about how great the economy and community is working together. But if you put that look through it through the phone, a volcano takes the place of the refinery. This is an actual animation, I don't have a movie of it, but you see it starts to erupt in the distance. What's really nice is that actually there's emissions going off in the same refinery in the background at the same time. So, and then all of a sudden the whole thing fills with smog. So <laughs> once it's seen, it can't be unseen. Now I see volcanoes there all the time. But you had to go there to see this. This doesn't work. This book doesn't work without you actually going to that location and being situated in those, uh, in that specific spot. So if you tap it again, I started presenting normal light. I got these from Value Village and added volcanoes to them. So they're kind of bucolic, beautiful industrial scenes. Uh, maybe the history of Hamilton with volcanoes. So you know, it's always been with us. This is normal, except this. See, there's more volcanoes. Here's Jesus and the children of volcanoes. This is uh, a reference to not religion, the Christian religion, but to like a lot of religious industries that depend on the poverty of the city to uh, keep going. Then you see a source, well, of importance, economic property, and environmental history. So I see this sort of philosophy going through, these kind of views uh, that I'm dealing with. And here's that quote. And then those text narratives start to appear. So these will actually work from anywhere, but these represent the public view. So we can't really get into this, but there's some criticism in here in this generally optimistic view of Hamilton. Do you know it has the most waterfalls in any city? Well, that doesn't make any difference to me. I'm not nowhere near a waterfall, you know. But I also installed them in places here, which, which aren't part of the book. So if people wanted to, they could explore without the book or even knowing anything. They just download the app and they'll see narratives. All of a sudden, I've taken over city science and installed my own personal plaques talking about some of my experiences here. So here I sort of like criticize Hamilton a bit. But then later I talk about archaeologists finding that civilizations that used to live on the side of volcanoes, what stupid people they were. So the three narratives that come together through text and the imagery are the political, public, and the personal. Do we have time to look at one more? No. Thank you very much. <laughs> For the record, Chris, we don't care if it's getting a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Do we have questions? A little faster, yeah. I thought. I loved this everything about this project. And I want to pick up on one tiny strand and just ask for your thought. When you talk about the urban flood art, that triggered for me my feminist art history class that I took as an undergraduate. And one of the things that was sort of pounded into us in the critique of the flood art and its role in the growth of sort of modern art in the late 19th century was that some people got to be urban flood artists and some people did not have to be urban flood artists. And I wonder, I mean, I love the sort of, you know, very, um, the idea that this winner is subverting a particular modes and ways that we are supposed to be using our environment. Um, but there's also, you know, the ability of who gets to participate in that sort of movement, of course, is, you, you want to reflect on that at all? Yeah, I mean, and that's reflected in the Oxford Dictionary definition of flaneur, which is a man who saunters about observing society. You know, I've got nothing the better to do because I'm, you know, privileged to them to walk around and make judgments about you. Um, which, sure, you know, like, I, I won't, uh, I won't deny that I've had um, the privilege of being able to do that. A lot of my time here has been uh, walking around taking pictures. Um, but in my case, a lot of it was either being unemployed or, or injured and unable to work, which kind of brought about that, that, uh, that aspect of it. So, I think you're, I think you're right. I think. Um, 
I think it was. Yeah, very much that way. I don't mean that, you know, like, have you been to be privileged to do such a thing? You know, but it is interesting to think that we just moved through a river. That's right, yeah, and, and that, that sort of rhetoric I quoted earlier was interesting, talked about like, you know, communities, or, you know, the real estate rhetoric was like communities like really thrive if they have like walkability and, and connection to, to public transportation, which is a, a common thing you see among activists and city policy together. Um, so that kind of touches upon, upon that, but it's more, um, the, what here, when the example was that Flinner subverts sort of the economic landscape, but the rhetoric in the public sphere in Hamilton reinforces it as an economic development model. So there's a tension, and that's again, that's another example of what if was here, right? Like, what is it, Flender this, or is it this? So there's a, a problematic paradox in the community by that definition. All right, thank you. Thank you.